This is Hear Me Out. I'm Celeste Headley. We're a little over six years away from the next nationwide census. So yeah, it's not exactly a pressing issue for most of us anyway. As the Washington Post wrote in early November, there's a small but mighty group of academics and activists who are pushing for a big change to the census. Right now, you're asked about your race on the census, and that data is treated as an immutable fact that impacts lots of decisions and philosophies about American life. So what if the census was retooled and we stopped placing so much emphasis on definitive racial categories? The major shift that I think is necessary and doable is instead of perpetuating this false notion by talking about each other in terms of race, let's recognize that we're all racialized. Sometimes adversely, sometimes advantageously. Teacher, social worker, and activist, Carlos Hoyt joins us in just a moment. Stay with us. A Netflix original film. The Wi-Fi is working. In the event of a global communications breakdown, do the following. Stay inside. What just happened here is happening everywhere. Avoid strangers. We've all been deserted. I don't trust them. And most importantly, do not panic. Julia Roberts. What happens next? Mahershala Ali. I knew something was coming. Leave the world behind. Rated R. Now playing only on Netflix. Welcome back to Hear Me Out. I'm Celeste Headley. Most of us spend very little time thinking about the census. Once every 10 years, we'll get a letter in the mail or maybe a knock on the door. And beyond that, the census is not really a priority for most Americans. Now, if you are already typing an email to us that says, actually, you think about the census a lot, slow down for a second. We get it. Obviously, there are a lot of reasons to care about the census. The data that the census collects impacts so many parts of our lives. Your representation in Congress, the amount of federal funding your state receives, your long-term civic planning, and a million other things. The census also shapes our understanding of what America looks like, what Americans look like. When we talk about being a melting pot, although hopefully most people don't use that term anymore... Census data is a great demonstration of that point. So it may surprise you to know there are those who want the census to stop keeping track of race so rigidly because race is not real to begin with, biologically speaking. Here to pitch us that very radical idea is Dr. Carlos Hoyt, a teacher and author whose advocacy on this was recently uh, included in the Washington Post. Hi. Hi, Celeste. Thanks so much for having me. It's an honor. So glad to have you here, because when I read your Washington Post piece, I completely disagreed with you, but I found myself going, you know, he's he's got some good points. So uh, for the benefit of our listeners, give us the the elevator spiel. What's this? The short, brief summary of your opinion here. Sure. And I'll start with um, a correction that I think might be helpful to everybody. Um, so some folks have reacted to the article and my push with the census by assuming or coming away with thinking that Dr. Carlos Hoyt wants us to stop keeping track of race. Um, I don't, right? Uh, so I don't know if the show's over now. But <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit more complicated and nuanced than that. Um, I want us to reckon with, you know, our very tangled and tortured um, history and attachment to an idea that, as you said earlier, I believe, you know, has no uh, empirical basis, uh, gets us, has gotten us into all sorts of trouble and still gets us into trouble. Uh, but nonetheless, people have a lot of attachment to it as a social construct. Uh, as a psychotherapist, as a person who I hope is compassionate and respectful of everybody's um, right to self-define however they want to, I don't walk around saying to people, you know, stop being black, you know, or stop, you know, being attached to whatever race or whatever identity is important to you. That's not what I'm about. I am, however, you know, about scientific accuracy. I am about the government, you know, not perpetuating a false idea and imposing it on people. And I am about giving everybody, you know, a chance to be represented. So if there are people, you know, who don't actually, you know, self-identify by this thing that we call race, how are we recognizing them, you know, in the world? And if we can do that in a way that doesn't take away from the important services that keeping track of uh, racialization and discrimination uh, accomplish, then we should probably consider that. That's what I'm about in a nutshell. So I want to sort of break this apart because this the conversation is not over. 
but I feel like we can start from a, a place of agreement. I mean, there's no question that that biological race is not real. And I apologize if that's coming as news to anybody listening. I can't imagine it is. Uh, but there's no such thing as uh, looking at somebody's biological parts, their blood or anything else, and knowing what race they are. Um, but I, I mean, I think you and I can both agree that that race is real because racism is real, because society divides us and we have a different life according to what our perceived race is. We can both agree there, right? I would agree um, that racism is absolutely real because when we continue to see ourselves and others in terms of the false construct of race. Okay. So you, though, you say that if we accept that race is a false concept, you don't need to accept it. That's just the truth. Um, but we, if we keep, and I apologize if I'm misquoting you, but you said if we accept that it's a false concept, but we continue to separate people or label people according to race, you said that was intellectually problematic. What does that mean? Absolutely. So I'll give you a, a couple of analogies. You know, you and I probably share the way of talking about looking at the sun by saying it rises or it sets and stuff like that. Now, we yeah. know that's the case. We know that's the earth is sort of moving in certain ways. Um, and that's okay as a way of talking about something. But if we ever tried to navigate, you know, space and the stars, you know, based on thinking that the uh, sun actually goes around the earth, we'd be in a lot of trouble, right? We know better, right? So we don't actually put any practical stake in that. Uh, so for folks to call themselves whatever they want to call themselves, that's one thing. But to act on a falsity can lead us into trouble. And that's what we do with race. We know it's a social construct. Um, as you were saying earlier, I hope all of our listeners know that, but there's no biology there. But then we take that knowledge and we put it in our pockets and we act as if it's real. Because we subdivide according to it, we have prejudices and biases according to it, and we treat people as if they are real distinctions based on that. Right? And that's problematic. And the government uh, inducts us into continuing to do that by saying, whenever there's a census, especially a decennial one, what is your race? So again, that precludes the opportunity for people who don't even identify by race to say that, and it misses the point you know, of what causes racism. And that is the way somebody else identifies you. How is this different from the argument you hear most frequently from from white people that I don't even see color. How is this different from, you know, sort of a, a, a refusing to see people's, I'm going to say racial differences because what we're really talking about is cultural differences, but how how is that different? Yeah, the um, I hope um, not too hard, at least intellectual switch that needs to be made is from referring to people as something that doesn't exist to referring to people in the way that they're treated. So you and I and everybody in this society anyway and around the world are racialized, right? We have a habit of mind um, that is strongly reinforced from the time we are born, especially in this kind of society, to look at somebody and based on what we see, to start to put them in categories, right? All sorts of categories. That's what the human brain does anyway. We do it well, and sometimes it's very useful. But when it comes to this concept of race, which is only a few hundred years old, as you know, um, and I know, I'm not sure, not sure all of our listeners know that, but we should know that, it's become a practice to say, if you have dark skin, if you have these craniofacial features, then I can make certain assumptions about you, right? So first we select something as a way to differentiate between people, then we sort them into these groups. Right? Then we start to attribute all sorts of things. Well, you know, I feel like these people who are darker, these people who are lighter have this or that, good things, bad things. Then in terms of race, we make that essential. Right, It's in their bones. It's in their DNA. It can never change. It's that way from generation after generation, which was very handy you know, for people who wanted to perpetuate slavery generation after generation. And then we act on it. Right, So that's all about racialization. Right, Race is a product of racialization. It's how we come up with race. And then race serves as the basis for racism. It serves as the basis for lots of wonderful things too, solidarity, pride, a sense of culture, et cetera. So that's absolutely worth talking about. And what do we do about that, you know, if we stop thinking about race? And I think there are good answers to that. But the major shift that I think is necessary and doable is instead of perpetuating this false notion by talking about each other in terms of race, let's recognize that we're all racialized. Sometimes 
adversely, you know, too many of us, sometimes advantageously, right? And we get some privileges that we don't deserve. This feels um, a little bit cart before the horse um, because you're talking about not talking about race anymore before we've gotten rid of the prejudice. I mean, it's very hard for me to accept the idea that if we stop for at least for governmental purposes, for official purposes, labeling people or categorizing people by race, then all of the racism is still there. Let's say that the we believe in what the, the Supreme Court believes in, that everyone should have the same shot. And so we stopped keeping track of diversity in college admissions. Well, we've seen what that happens. It, it means a drop in the number of black and brown kids who get into elite schools, especially. So, I mean, it's great to say we're going to stop labeling people like this, but that's not going to make the racism go away. It's not going to make people in a silent way and in a quiet and secretive way, continue to, to separate them. Um, it wouldn't if that were what we were to do. Uh, and I agree with you on that, but that isn't what we should do. What the Supreme Court decision around affirmative action has done, I and mean, well, done a lot of things, has upset a lot of people, but it's also forcing our hand to find a better way to get at what we need to get at. And that is social inequity, You know, that is based on social bias, having to do with this thing called race. So again, I want to say it's not to stop talking about race because race is not going to go away just because Dr. Hoy says stop talking about race. It's talking about race in a way that is effective to actually deal with racism, right? And that's moving away from race as a proxy for automatic differences that ought to guide how we see each other to talking about how do we ease up on racialization? How do we understand the effects of racialization? And let's talk about affirmative action and ways to fix that a little bit later if we want to, because I'd love to. But in terms of like, how do we accomplish this without putting the cart before the horse, as you say, I don't know if you had a chance to look at um, the things that I, I, I shared with you before the show. And it's really okay if you haven't, I can walk through them no, now. No, it, it is, but none of our listeners have. All so, right, so let, yeah. let's talk about that a little bit, if that's okay. Um, so one of the things I shared with Celeste, and I just want to pause and say, thank you for being receptive to that. Not everybody is. like They just want to do their show and move on. Uh, but this stuff is a bit more nuanced than just having a, an off-the-cuff conversation. So I had this um, proposal to the U.S. Census, and it's multi-pages, and I won't go into all of it here. Uh, but if you think of the census form, and even if you're not very familiar with it at home because you only look at it you know, once every 10 years, it says something like, you know, what is the person's race? And then you are to fill in, you know, what your race is from the options that are there, and they're the ones that most of us know, you know, white, black, African American, uh, Asian, all the way through, right? Uh, a limited set of uh, choices. The proposal that I have for the census uh, would look like this. You would get in your mail uh, a form that asks you all the demographic questions, and when it comes to race and ethnicity, and the census is probably going to collapse those categories, but let's say for now they're, they're still separate, you would see this question. How do you identify by race or ethnicity? Right? Pretty clear question. Right? So the second question I want to add, and how do others identify you by race or ethnicity? Right? right now, that second question isn't there on the census. Right? And I want to say that's the key to understanding discrimination. Not how I identify myself, right? but how the person on the street who wants to be nice to me or not identifies me. So that question is key. And adding that would be very important to collecting uh, accurate data. The options for answering would include, one, I do not identify by race. Check it or don't check it. Right. Two, I do not identify by ethnicity. Check it or don't check it. It's an option. And then, you know, the money comes in terms of um, what I think is uh, important. How do I identify if I do identify by race and ethnicity? And how do others identify me? Within that set of questions, and there's not a whole lot of them there, we capture all the possible ranges of the way that people think about each other in terms of race or ethnicity. And we also learn for the first time in the history of the census how others identify you, because that is what discrimination turns on. So that's not ceasing to talk about race. It's not putting the cart before the horse. It's actually straightening out the whole apparatus, because right now it's pretty bent and broken. We're going to have to take a break, but uh, real quickly, how would your answers be? Because I, I have to tell you, other people never get my race right. I mean, they think I'm Dominican. Um, the, the way other people to identify me is not 
I mean, I can see how that would av avoid uh, those who want to be another race or not be racial. Uh, you know, we have had some headline stories about people pretending to be a race that they're not, and lots of people pretending to be Native American. But how would you answer that? Yeah, so in my proposal, I actually used myself as an example, right? So how do you identify by race or ethnicity, and how do others identify you by race or ethnicity? Carlos Hoyt. <laughs> um, I would check, I do not identify by race. I won't check, I do not identify by ethnicity, because I think ethnicity is actually a useful category. I can say where I'm from and where my people are from and all that stuff. How do I identify? I check right now Hispanic Latino uh, because I was born in Costa Rica and that's part of my heritage. And uh, how others identify me. I check Hispanic or Latino again because I do get that in the world. People hear me, see me, and they can sort of pick up your Caribbean, aren't you? And we go up into a nice conversation. And I also checked Black or African American for how others identify me. I didn't check it for how I identify myself. Right, because I consider myself an adversely racialized black male in this society, but I don't consider myself black because there's no such thing as that. So I deliberately sort of put out that clunky set of words to show that there's a distance between the two. But I do want to make sure that people understand that when I'm out on the street, people identify me as black or African American, and that matters, just as you, they identify you ambiguously, differently, etc. That's important information. Okay, we're going to take a break, but we'll be back because there there is a lot more to sift through here. Uh, I'm Celeste Headley. You're listening to Hear Me Out, a podcast from Slate, and we're talking about whether or not uh, the government should keep track of our race. We'll be back in a moment. Stay with us. Hey, this is Mary Harris, host of Slate's daily news podcast, What Next? Slate's mission has always been to cut through the noise boldly and provocatively. This election season and Supreme Court term are no different. Important coverage like this, though, it would not be possible without the support of our Slate Plus members. So I'm going to invite you to join us with a special offer. You can try your first three months for only 15 bucks. That is five bucks a month for your first three months of uninterrupted ad-free listening on every Slate podcast member exclusive episodes and segments of your favorite shows like Amicus and the Political Gap Fest, and unlimited reading on the Slate site. Best of all, you'll be supporting all of Slate's independent journalism and analysis as we make sense of the news like no one else can. Sign up for Slate Plus at slate.com slash podcasts plus. Again, that is three months for only 15 bucks. So sign up now at slate.com slash podcast plus. Today is the beginning of a new year and a new decade. The nation and the world says goodbye to the 1980s and looks to the 90s. Kawabunga. I'm Josh Levine. You can't touch this. And for the next season of Slate's podcast, One Year, you can't touch this. we're slipping on some incredibly baggy pants and taking you back to 1990. You'll hear about the single dad who fought back against big tobacco, all while hiding behind a secret identity. I'm looking around like people were at the bus stop looking at us, and I was like, oh my God, and here comes a police car. In Cincinnati, an art exhibit became a battleground over the First Amendment. I remember one of my board members said, so what's this? And I said, well, it's called fisting. And, and she said, oh, fisting, How, what's that all about? One Year, 1990. Available now, wherever you get your podcasts. And we're back. I'm Celeste Headley. This is Hear Me Out, a podcast from Slate in which people disagree with integrity and without insulting each other. And, and that's what's happening now. I'm speaking with Dr. Carlos Hoyt. Uh, he is a clinical social worker and psychotherapist, but also a, a, a writer. And he's an advocate for the idea that the Census Bureau should change the way it tracks race um, and no longer give us check boxes. Now that part, I, I wanted to start with the check boxes because I absolutely believe that even if it makes it harder for the statisticians to parse our data, I agree with that part. I don't think we should have to be forced to put an X in a box to identify race. I do think it'd be more nuanced. But I, I will say this, that 
the racial categories that I belong to. And it took me a long time to get to the point where I would just simply say, I'm black and Jewish and and simply not take other people's opinions on how I should, I should or shouldn't identify. The, those categories are important to me. They're important because tragically being of of a, a, a descendant of uh, Jews in this day and age means you have endured um, historic trauma. <laughs> you know, we lost a large part of our family to the Holocaust. And the same is true for the black side of my family. You know, I'm two generations removed from a slave plantation in Georgia. Um, and, you know, even though I'm the product of both the slave and the slave owner, there was no question when the Civil War ended, which family was going to take me in, or my side of the family in, right? I mean, the, the white family was never going to take us in, and that has been true all along. And so that category, that history is part of the label for me. And, and I mean, I get that you're sa you say I should be able to identify however I want, like that should be up to me. But for you, you said that your response would be that you don't identify racially, but ethnically, what is that difference? Um, first of all, thanks for sharing like some of your heritage that matters to you. I think, and census aside, you know, earlier in the program, we said like, don't ask people that, like, you know, <laughs> where are you from? But if there are just, if we could be better at inviting people to tell us who they are <laughs> and just listening, I think that would be awesome. Agree. And it's 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 humanizing. It's connected. Um, it's respectful. And I'm not saying the census needs to do that, but I just think you modeled a very nice way of talking about sort of personal identity. So just as you, you know, did that very thoughtfully, and I respect that, shouldn't we respect that all around too? And if there are people, I'll give an analogy to religion. Now, the census doesn't ask about people's religion right now. Let's say yeah. it did, right? And all the categories were some religion, right? And there was no option to say, I'm agnostic or I'm atheist, or, I'm not sure. That wouldn't be fair, right? It would be forcing people, you know, to choose one, like pick one of the things that we're giving you. Uh, and that actually gets to freedom of speech <laughs> and freedom against coerced speech. Because if you don't give an option for something that people will actually subscribe to, then we're not being fair to them. That's the race analogy here, right? Not taking away from the fact that most people do indeed identify by race. That's just statistically the case. But if there are people who don't, and we're not recognizing those people's op op and giving them an option to say so, then we're not doing the job that the census is actually built to do, which is to acknowledge people's self-identification in this country. So that's just a technical thing that we just need to make, get better at. So why don't I um, choose to say that I identify by race? Because of what we said before. I think it's a mistake um, to sort of put myself into a box that someone else put me in historically to subjugate me. That's my feeling about it. Now, do I take pride in all of the people who look like me and have been labeled that way, who have overcome that and combated it and have has actually made it possible for me to be where I am doing exactly what I'm doing now? Absolutely. But I sort of translate that pride and uh, spread it across any group of people who have ever resisted that kind of oppression. I feel in solidarity with all of them, and I don't feel the need to sort of shrink that down to one's particular identity. Right. So that's that's part of my reasoning for that. It's interesting because um, I have changed my mind on this. I can remember I was on a panel with my friend Aaron Dworkin, and he founded the Sphinx Competition, which is to try and increase the the representation of black and brown people in classical music. Um, and I was on the other side of this fence. I was making your argument, saying, you know, my goal is to sort of make these connections between people and, and stop focusing so much on race, et cetera, et cetera. And I remember Aaron saying, you know, that's your gift, Celeste, that you get to um, work towards a, a world that is a, a more a, a letting people, you know, be who they are individually, but, but seeing everyone as human. And he said, but my job is to increase representation, which means I have to count, I have to label and I have to separate. Um, and so for those activists and advocates whose whole job is to to maybe fix some of the inequities, they they have to keep track of race, don't they? With all due respect to, I'm sure you're a very wise and, and hardworking friend, I think it's a false dichotomy, right? 
we can do the both end there. You know, we can recognize that the world is beset. You know, the world is in trouble, you know, because we put people in these boxes and we mistreat some of them based on that. And we give some others like ridiculous privileges based on that. To solve that, we have to concentrate on the categorization, on the classification, on the fact that still, this is still happening. And at the same time, we can educate against that habit of mind. If we don't change the habit of mind, how will we ever stop having the problem? So it's not either or. It's not either, you know, you are, you know, down with a strict and reductive identification of who you are and you go to fight for your people, you know, till the end, or you're colorblind. It's not one or the other. You know, it's realizing that there's a falsity in terms of this categorization. It's rooted in terms of subjugation. Um, and to get past it, we have to educate towards that and deal with the trouble that is still in our face, which is that too many people think that way, and as a result, treat people poorly that way, individually, interpersonally, structurally, historically, systemically, and institutionally. Like that has not gone away, and I'm not here to say that it has. I'm actually here to say that to make it go away, we have to appreciate the racialization part and push, push, push against that habit of mind uh, until we get past it. So do you um, describe your point of view as uh, post-racialization? Um, I'd like us to get post-racialization. We're not there yet, obviously. My thing yeah. is about um, recognizing and addressing racialization. That is the habit of mind and behavior and policy that we have been stuck in since this country was founded, right? We were built in great part on racialization by being able to say that those people who look like that have these attributes and therefore we are justified in exploiting them in all kinds of ways. That's what racialization is. That's the way it's been for the beginning. And the census has it baked into how it asks us and actually compels us to continue to stay in that line of thinking, right? Locked into that box, not even giving people a chance to say, this doesn't work for me. And by the way, it makes no sense. So while we're trying to get out of this trap of racism, let's use that you know, as a tool, as knowledge, as information to start to put some space between that terrible habit of mind and, you know, a freer day when we're seeing each other differently. We can do both at once. So, you know, a lot of people who identify as white have been unhappy um, with the Census Bureau for quite a long time. And I, I've spoken with many of them. Some of them are legislators. And, and that is as we get closer and closer to the date when the U.S. becomes is no longer majority white. Um, there's a fear there, and hopefully a fear that's not accompanied as it has been in pa the past by violence, but this fear that they will lose their dominance that has been based on race. But A, I feel like it's important to be really realistic about what we get from the census data. The, there is an undercount, and there has been for a long time, of, of black and brown people, and that has had big consequences, right? But also, the way that the Census Bureau, the, that data is used, as we mentioned at the top, to stop tracking it in the census is not just about stop, tra stopping to track it in the census, right? There's a lot of legislation that's based on drawing district lines, getting their funding formulas, setting inclusivity targets. Also, political power that's weighed based on the size of a, a, a particular population. Would political parties um, spend any time at all, even the tiny amount of performative outreach that they do, if they didn't have this data showing that soon uh, black and brown people would be the voting majority. I don't, I don't think so. In the recommendation I'm making, people are still being asked to say how they are identified, right? And that is where that data will show up, right? So- Sorry to interrupt you, but it wouldn't, in my case, like again, if I were to say the most, the majority of people, when they make a guess at my ethnicity, they choose wrong. They think I'm, I'm Dominican. <laughs> Right, so uh, that that wouldn't be correct. That data would not not be accurate. Well, it's accurate in terms of how the majority of people see you, but you're also going to add how you see yourself, because as you've already told us, that's important to you. So now you're you're you're, you're volunteering two points of information that are important data points for the census. You're going to check which one. Which one will you check? I check white and black. Okay, right. So that data point is preserved because you choose to give that information. 
right? So we haven't lost anything by making this addition. But we do, I mean, if we go further, I mean, we have to take a break again. But before we go, let me ask you this. There is a positive side to to tracking this data in that it also lets us uh, keep track of progress or or the lack of it for certain groups, especially those like African Americans who are the most discriminated against in the United States, and especially Black women. Um, that it does allow us to see if progress has been made or not been made. Right, and I, you know, I will. You know, take it as my own failure that I don't seem to be making this clear, but you and I agree on this, Celeste, right? The only thing I would do, you know, sort of to make the space that I think is important is instead of insisting that people identify by race, especially if they don't, is to say, you know, we need to keep track of how people are racialized in this country because racialization has impacts on how they are treated, on representation, on the apportionment of resources, et cetera, that we can keep. And if within that, there are people who want to say, oh, it's not just racialization, Dr. Hoyt. I actually feel like, you know, I'm black and I'm proud of that and I'm this and I'm proud of that. They can say that too, because I think that's important information as well. Enhancing, expanding, you know, the amount of liberty, freedom, right for people to say who they are is basically what this is about. And if the government does not want that, that level and depth and range of accuracy and identification, why wouldn't it want it? Like there's no price to this at all. There's just a game. So I, I feel like I do understand, but I think I'm the one not explaining myself clearly. But we'll, we'll come back and get back to that in a moment. Uh, this is Hear Me Out, and we will continue this conversation after this break. And we're back. This is Hear Me Out, a podcast from Slate. And we're talking about whether or not we need to reform the way we keep track of race. And I... I before the break, I was saying, I think I'm the one at fault here. Um, and I'll explain by saying I absolutely get that what you're asking the Census Bureau to do is not to stop tracking demographic information, but to change the way and you say deepen, uh, and perhaps more nuanced. The problem for me is that you're asking for self reports and people, I mean, you have a PhD, you've read enough research to know that self reporting is the least accurate way. Now I get that that that's not a change, right? Like what we have now is people checking boxes and that's a self-report and what you're asking is uh simply a different version of that. But when you open that up a little to people's interpretation, which is sounds like what you're doing, um and say, "Hey, how how do you like to identify yourself? How do you define yourself? And then how do other people identify yourself?" I feel like we're going to get Yet a lot of people, A, that choose, especially uh, among the white population, who say, I don't identify by race at all because they're not usually uh, required to think about race as often as black and brown people are. But also there's a lot of people who cross over racial lines because they they want to be something else for good reasons. And I, and I say this because there's a massive number of, say, Latino and Hispanics who choose to identify as white. And so if you open that up, uh, we might get a larger white population than we expected. I mean, do you, do you not think there's a danger inside of giving people more latitude to be creative? Uh, let's explore that. You have already realized within your own articulation that this thing you're afraid of is already happening, right? When we started doing the census, somebody showed up at your door and they told you what you were, right? And there are still times when that happens, like a, a police officer who stops us on the road in their records, they go to write down what race they think we are. That's like the battle, right? They get to identify us. But right around 1960, I forget sometimes when the change was, we got to self-identify. In that moment, it became subjective. You can put down whatever you want to on the census. Nobody can tell you otherwise, right? That's happening now. And that's why, you know, so many people, like 50 million people, you know, say some other race, like they just don't want to play, right? And then some people actually change their race, you know, developmentally, they realize something about their ancestry, or they feel like I'm multiracial and I want to be this one now. I have a right to do that. So the subjectivity is baked in. Let's just admit that, right? 
So if there is creativity as a concern, let's just realize that creativity has always been there and it continues to be there. And it's one of the census's biggest challenges. How do we get people to check off the things that work for us statistically? They're not going to be able to get people to tell the truth. Yeah. Right. So the change I'm, um, I'm proposing doesn't change the subjectivity. It just expands the opportunity for people to self-express. And I actually think that's a great thing. You know, so how do we make sure they're expressing the right thing? Now we're back into the trap because you're you're basically saying I'm essentially something that I better know what I am. You know, otherwise, what am I lying? You know, what if I have a white identified parent and a black identified parent? Do I have to put down that I'm biracial or do I get to choose, right? Which one means like Barack Obama, you know, wrote a beautiful book about this to put his stake in the ground as being a black African American male. Now, so somebody could say, technically, that's nonsense, Barack. Like, that doesn't make any sense. But it's his choice, right? It's a question of how I choose to identify. That's what we want to know. And we want to know how other people identify you because that's what plays out on the street, right? That's what plays out in the employment office. That's what plays out on the road when I'm stopped by the state trooper. It's who they think I am, right? So that's important information that we're not tracking right now. I, th- I mean, that part I can agree with. I I... I'm not entirely convinced that the way other people see you racially, um, it's best captured with that question. And I mean, I don't want to repeat myself, but it's it's because the way other people see you is so wildly inaccurate, to at least the way they see me. I think it is important information, but I think there must be better ways of doing that. In other words, rather than do, going through the census and saying how do most other people see you, um, Perhaps there is a way that researchers at least um, can um, start asking people to give their best guess at other people's ethnicity and see how accurate those generally are. I mean, I know that that there is already research that's been done on that, and, and we know that people are not particularly accurate if somebody's race is supposedly not clear, does not hit those stereotypical markers that we think separate one race from another Again, race is not biologically real. So (laughs) every time I'm using it, it, you can fill in cultural instead. I think the thing for me uh, uh, is that we're so not, we're so far behind the world in which people are ready to, to uh, advance this way. And I, I, I'm not sure that getting rid of the markers now before we've made other progress in terms of unconscious bias and the fact that science tells us that people make these assumptions about other people and it's within 0.5 seconds of meeting a new person. I just feel like this is getting getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. So now we've gone backwards a little bit, right? So we're, this is so much about representation and it's important for me that I'm not misrepresented, right? So of I course. was again, I am not talking about getting rid of the markers. Right. Right. I'm not talking about getting rid of the markers. I'm talking about how we navigate the fact that we mark each other in these ways and the effects of that and how to be as accurate and as inclusive as possible about what we do with those things because we will continue to categorize ourselves. Dr. Hoyt is not saying that's going to disappear because he was going to wave a wand. That's not what this is about. It's not that. I mean, again... This is such a, a nuanced subject that it's. I'm finding it difficult. And this, of course, is your area of expertise. So I apologize that I am a little bit more ham-handed here than, than you are, obviously. But I would say that I don't think people... I'm not sure people are evolved enough to understand these nuances and answer in ways that are truly meaningful. I'm trying to think of many of the politicians I've interviewed over the course of my 25, 26 years at NPR. Do, will they understand the, the nuances of what this new data might show? Will they answer these questions in, in meaningful ways? I'm, I'm just, I'm not sure about that. People have often and almost always um, used anything that's related to race to benefit themselves and what they think of as their own group and um, disadvantage others that they think might be a threat to what they have. One might wonder then, boy, is there some way to see how this might work without just changing things, you know, altogether? And actually, the census is pretty good at that, right? Yes. They can do all sorts of, you know, studies and beta tests and 
um, focus groups. Like we can test this thing like to the ground before we actually have to do anything with it. And that's part of my proposal too. I actually give the census a big slap on the back, you know, for saying, you know how to do that part. So to start doing it, right? And if at the end of all of that, it turns out this isn't going to work or it might make things worse, let's not do it. But why wouldn't we start to look into it? Because again, in the short amount of time that we've been talking, and I'm not surprised because you're super smart and you're super open-minded, right? You get it. Like you can't deny the logic of it. So then we start to worry, is it too soon? All right, let's find out if it's too soon, right? Let's do some focus groups. Let's have some people fill this thing out. Let's see how it goes. And I would add like, how's what we've been doing been working for us? Like the second most checked off box in the census is some other race, which is people's way of saying, I'm not playing. Like, how is that doing anything for us? Never yeah, mind. See, there you got me. There, You're in full agreement with me. The way that we've been doing it is for crap. Like it's clearly not working. Um, and when I talked about it, it's showing progress or lack thereof. Mostly it shows the lack of progress. So there, 100% agreement. We're also, you know, um, statistically, we're seeing more and more, quote unquote, sort of mixture of quote unquote races. Like there's more ambiguity every day, you know, in terms of these categories. They're breaking down into each other. It doesn't mean they're going away. So again, <laughs> people out there listening, don't start writing me letters saying I think they're going away. Oh, they're going to write you letters. <laughs> <laughs> I welcome them. <laughs> Um, more and more people are wanting more and more choice to express the nuances of who they are, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we should honor that as best we can. And we should acknowledge that one of the choices that some people want is to say, I don't like being, you know, shoved into a category that doesn't exist, that was built to subjugate me and other people, et cetera, et cetera. So give me a chance to just say that. That's a constituency in our society that has been made invisible from the time we started doing this. We don't have to keep doing that. And we don't have to lose anything by giving a people a chance to express that freedom of expression. So a, a lot to think about in this episode. And I hope you do think about it and then send us your thoughts. Send us the product of all of your mulling over time. We really want to hear what you think. The address is hearmeout at slate.com. Hear Me Out is a podcast from Slate. The show is produced by Maura Curry. Ben Richmond is the Senior Director of Podcast Operations. And Alicia Montgomery is VP of Slate Audio. I am your host, Celeste Headley. And until next time, please speak your mind, but please keep it open. Hold up. 